which requires vast knowledge, skills and professionalism to train trainers with the aim of equipping them with knowledge and skills, which of course they'll use in return to train other students. Well, we are here at the Health Tutors College Mulago, where we are going to find out how the education services here contribute to the health of Uganda. Well, my name is Amuge Victoria and you are welcome to the Education Forum. So let's go and see what exactly takes place here in this college. Welcome to the Education Forum and as I mentioned before, we are here at the Health Tutors College Mulago and joining me on the show right now is the principal of the Health Tutors College Mulago. Welcome, madam. Thank you. Yeah, we are glad to have you on the show. Thank you. And before we could go any further, could you please introduce yourself to the viewers? Okay. Thank you, viewers. Uh, this is Health Tutors College Mulago. And I'm the principal, Dr. Karen Karo. Dr. Rai Kobe is my name. And uh, Health Tutors College Mulago is located here in Mulago complex, next to dental school, and before you reach Tasso. Thank you. All right, well, thank you very much, Madam Principal. Uh, so, Madam Principal, tell us how and when the government established this college. Okay, uh, Health Tutors College was established way back in 1967 when the government realized the need to train tutors for the health training institutions. And then before that, they were sending uh, the health uh, professionals like nurses, midwives, abroad for training as health tutors. So when they realized that it was costly for the government, then through the Ministry of Health, the government established the Health Tutors College. And it is started by training nurse tutors on a diploma program of one year. And it had a small capacity by then but to date, the capacity has grown mm -hmm. from a class of 14. Now we have a class of 100. Yeah. All right. Okay, so how, how come this is the only health tutors college so far? Uh, so far, this is the only government-owned uh, health tutors college. And you may realize that the health training institutions in, uh, there have not been very many earlier on, but right now the numbers are growing. And as the number is growing, now the demand for the tutors is growing. But before that, because of the small numbers, the tutors who were coming out from this institution were enough to be absorbed in the health training institutions, which were existing. And up to now, the numbers which the institution is uh, producing are still enough because uh, in a year, at least we have an output of about 150. Sometimes it's more than that because we have the three programs which are run in this institution. That is the Bachelor of Medical Education we, it has a capacity of 100 students, and we have the postgraduate medical education program with also a capacity of 100, but right now we haven't hit that capacity of 100. Mm -hmm. So our admissions are ranging between 50, 60. Sometimes, like the last two years because of COVID, we've been having a low number of students coming for the admission. And then we have a program called Higher Diploma Clinical Instruction course, whereby these people also go and still work in the training institutions. And for this program, the number of students is uh, very low. Uh, the capacity is uh, of 20 students in a class. So when you look at the outcome of, from these three programs, we still have ample uh, numbers coming out, which can still be taken up by 
all these health training institutions. And so since the one school is still able, able to produce out that big number, then with the government resources, it may not be viable to start a second uh, health tutors college, but the one which is here is in the plan of having satellite centers in the regions. So when we have the satellite centers in the regions, it will able, be still able to train the tutors in those regions, either than being in Kampala okay, only. Uh, someone watching right now may be asking what are the satellite institutions? Okay. So maybe you could enlighten them more about the satellite institutions. Okay, thank you viewers. Uh, satellite centers are uh, centers which are established in the auxiliaries in for the institution to be able to host some trainings in those centers at regular intervals. They may not be full time, but we can have like weekend programs which can be extended to people who are unable to come to the college for full-time programs. So we can host them on a part-time or modular programs, which may even be weekend programs. And the staff from the college are taken to host those trainings at those specified times okay. on specific days. All right. Thank you. So when it comes to designing uh, the curriculum, what procedures do you follow and who is in charge of designing this curriculum? Okay, uh, designing our curriculums, uh, Health Tutors College is affiliated to Makerere University because the school was established by Minister of Education as a diploma awarding institution. And in 1993, when the government transferred, no, 1993, yeah, when the government uh, transferred all training institutions to Ministry of Education, originally, actually, the college was under Ministry of Health, which is the mother ministry for health. Then when the schools went to Ministry of Education, it was realized that uh, the teachers in the training institutions must be a level higher than the products that they are producing out. And uh, some of these institutions from certificate awarding started giving uh, the awards of diploma programs. So the government realized it was not worth to bring out diploma holders to train the diploma uh, students. So it wanted to upgrade the diploma program to a bachelor's program. So uh, they sought for uh, affiliation from Makerere University. And with the affiliation of Makerere University, Makerere takes up the supervision of the programs that are in the college for quality, uh, quality assurance so the curriculums are developed in conjunction with between Ministry of Education and Sports, Makerere University, and then other departments like uh, DES, that is Director of Education Standards, plus some of the staffs in the college. And in the process of development of the curriculum, usually most of these programs are already running. So now it's barely revision, trying to have a revised curriculum, like which is supposed to be done after every five, three to five years. And so when you are going to do the review of the curriculum, you first have to do a needs assessment because this is a program which is already on running. You need to do a needs assessment from the stakeholders in order to establish where there are gaps, so that some of these gaps can be addressed during the process of curriculum development. But it doesn't mean that we don't develop new uh, curriculums. Like recently, we have just developed a, a new curriculum for leadership and the management training for 
training schools. Okay, what is so, this leadership and management training all about? We want to make sure that our uh, heads of schools are uh, having the component of management which is taught to them because in our basic uh, trainings, we don't go so much into that. Because being uh, accounting officers in the institutions, they should be able to handle issues of human resource, issues of finance management, and all that can be taken care of in that management okay. program. Uh, Madam Principal, being a tutor is not only about training students or other yes. tutors as well. Yeah. There are other values that could actually be required of these tutors. So what procedures do you follow when picking these tutors? Well, uh, for sure, being a, a tutor is not only being in a classroom. First of all, for a healthy tutor, these must be people who have already been trained as health workers. And before you come to the tutor's college, we request you to have a minimum experience of two years in the health-related field where you are. And this is because as you are coming to teach these students, you must have the experience which you are going to give as examples for these tutors. Because much as the student tutors are also coming from the field, because we don't admit uh, S6 graduates or senior four graduates, our students are health professionals who are already working in the, under the Ministry of Health and have practiced as health workers for a long time and when they come to train they continue both in their area of uh, qualification from Ministry of Health like the nurses, the midwives, the allied health and allied health we have the laboratory technicians, the physiotherapists, we have the orthopedic technologies Actually, under light, we have about 23 disciplines. So all those come and here, and then also get that component of pedagogy. Pedagogy is basically getting the skills of teaching. So as they come here, they must have the basis from their original field of health. Because when you are a teacher in the health training institutions, you must be able to take your students to the practicum site, in the hospitals, in the health facilities, to be able to teach them in the clinical area so that they are able to practice what is taught in the class. Yeah. Right. So how about in times where these tutors are not performing well? Because sometimes this happens. Yeah. In some cases it happens. So if the tutors are not performing well, what do you do? Uh, basically, we expect them to perform, but as it goes, every time what you do may never be perfect. Mm -hmm. So where you realize somebody is not perform performing to the level, you summon this person, talk to them, and give them their areas of concern where they are not performing well, and give them another chance. Right. So I was moving around the compound and I realized that students here have portfolios and profiles. Yes. So what do you consider? How are these portfolios made and what is the importance of the portfolios? The student portfolios. The student portfolios. These student portfolios, basically these are files which contain the various activities that the students perform. For example, in, uh, in our practice, you must be able to take these students to community field. You must be able to take these students for uh, clinical placements. At the same time, we go for school practice. And then there are also classes which are ongoing, whereby they may be given assignments in the class. 
So this portfolio we talk about compiles all these different areas where the students go. And by the end of the course, they must have that file which has all the records of what they have covered from the program. All right. Yeah. Okay. So um, are there any particular areas that uh, need improvement in the college right now? And which areas could those be? Yes, of course, there will never be an area where you don't have gaps. Mm -hmm. So at Tutors College, we still have some gaps. One, our number of uh, full governing, government employed staff list. We have a very small number. For example, we have only 10 teachers on the government payroll. That is the principal inclusive. But when you look at the number of the students, the programs which are running, the number is so small. Therefore, we urge the government at least to add up for us more numbers of the tutors. Now, here we are as a, a health tutors college. According to the government, it's looking at the institution as a diploma awarding institution because we are affiliated to Makerere University for the award. Otherwise, on ground, we are producing degree tutors. And so, being a bachelor's award program, the teachers would like to be paid as other institutions or universities who are teaching these uh, degree programs. But in Tutors College, we are still looked at as diploma awarding institution. So you find our payments are still based on that level. And so it will be our wish to be looked at as a degree awarding institution and also to consider us at uh, that level where we are looked at as an autonomous institution for the degree awards. And then secondly, the institution, as you moved, it is a small ground. Mm -hmm. And I think you didn't see a hostel for the students. I saw. <laughs> anyway, you see curtains, you know it's a hostel. <laughs> the hostel only is for seven students. And those ones, basically, we only give it for the guild leaders. So the students barely don't have an accommodation. And they, they stay in the neighborhood. They get their own accommodation. And as an institution, it would be good for us to have our own hostel so that we have control over our learners. Because now where they are, you cannot have a control over them. Anything can happen to them there, you will not be in charge of it. But where they are under the school premises or the college premises, we can own them and have control over them, dictate on what is to be done and what is not to be done. So we would wish to have a student hostel the Mulago administration, Mulago Hospital administration gave us land which is still vacant. We just need to so get this is support. the land that is going to be used for the yeah. hostels. Yes, please. Okay. And then when you moved, you saw our dining hall. Yeah, I saw they saw you were <laughs> the dining hall. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So we would love to have a better dining hall, either than sitting in those tents. Mm -hmm. You know, when it rains, mm -hmm. the students can't eat from there. True. So it would be good if you can have a better construction, which we are looking forward to, the ministry, for support. Okay. We are already in, in talks with them. So we believe they are going to do something. <music>
Well, if you're just joining in on the show, welcome to the Education Forum here on UBC TV. And we are here at the Health Tutors College Mulago. And here with me is our guest of the day, uh, Principal Karen, who is the principal for the Health Tutors College Mulago. So, Madam Karen, yes, as I was moving around, I know I've mentioned that thing several times. Yes. <laughs> I moved around a lot. So, as I was moving around, I realized you're holding meetings. Yes. So I wanted to know what things do you discuss in these meetings and how have these meetings helped change the college? Okay. Thank you. As you moved around, you found us in a meeting. This was the academic board meeting. Uh, in this academic board meeting, we were basically discussing the results of the students before they are released. And uh, it, it helps us to go through individual performance of the students. They, it helps us to find out whether the students are performing well or not. And from these meetings, we are able to discuss on what could be the challenges making students not to perform well. Or if they have done well, then you say, look at how was it done, if it, this was done well, how can you make a continuity? And it helps us to improve on our performance and also in areas of concern, especially concerning academics. Okay, and speaking of meetings, how often do you carry out these meetings? Okay, uh, are you looking at meetings in general or you are looking at the academic board meeting which you found us on? Well, I think the meetings are all for the betterment of the college, so it could be yeah. both educational or other things okay. related in the college. Okay. Uh, we have several meetings which we usually conduct. One, we have uh, the staff meeting, which we conduct after every two weeks, usually in the college. Then we have management meeting, and the management meeting are every Mondays. We have the management meetings. Then we have some of these meetings like the Students' General Assembly, which we hold at the beginning of the semester and at the end of the semester. Or in case there are some other issues of concern, we can have them in between. And like when you are going to have a placement of students in the clinical area, you must hold meetings with them before you send them to the clinical area. And we also have these other meetings like the academic board meeting. Uh, sometimes we have the selection committee meetings. Those ones are done uh, depending on when you are releasing results or when you are going to admit the next students. So usually those ones are one meeting at a time on demand. So it means you also have meetings with the students? Yes, okay. we do. All of right. course, in an institution. If you can't have a meeting with your students, then it means you are not really concerned about the students because you must meet them in order to get their concerns, in order to give them the instructions that you want them to follow so that everything is done both on time and at the right time and place. Okay. Well, uh, I have a final question for you. Yes. So how do you stay informed about current events and of course, advancements uh, about the healthcare. <laughs> the, the, the healthcare system. Yeah. Of course, much as we are under Ministry of Education, we are still connected with the Ministry of Health. So any updates from Ministry of Health, we are able to access the information. And as I told you earlier, our students practice in the hospitals, in the health facilities, and uh, the lecturers or the tutors follow these students in those clinical areas. So as they move for supervision, they interact with the staff of the hospitals. And so we're able to get updates on uh, new issues concerning health. Thank you, Principal. <laughs> you. I enjoyed this conversation. I enjoy this conversation. Well, you're still, you're still watching the Education Forum here on UBC TV. Do not go anywhere. We have more interviews coming your way.
you are still watching the education forum here on UBC TV and we are back from the lecture room and yes here with me is a lecturer who is going to tell us more about himself and of course his role as a lecturer here at the Health Tutors College Mulago. Welcome sir. Uh, thank you. It's nice to have you on the show. My pleasure. Okay well introduce uh, yourself to the viewers. Um, dear viewers my name is Dr. Badru Musisi. Um, a, lecture, a senior lecturer at uh, Makerere University, College of Education and External Studies, School of Education, Department of Foundations and Curriculum Studies. I'm uh, an education economist, my profession, PhD, Economics of Education. And uh, I really specialize in uh, uh, training students in managing education resources as efficiently as possible. Uh, on top of that, I also an entrepreneur, instructor. I teach teacher trainees, healthy tutors, some entrepreneur skills that they will need at their places of work. Um, that is important especially in this post-COVID time because COVID taught us a lot, a lot of what works and what does not work. After this lockdown, oh, we realized that uh, there is need to shift from the old ways of doing things to new ways of doing things. But the best way to do that is first to reboot, retool, and reorient our teachers to be able to fit in this post-COVID era that requires a lot of innovation and more efficient ways of doing things. Okay. Yes. So how, how hectic is this subject that you teach the students? Uh, it's really hectic in a number of ways. One, it's time. It's a combination of economics and entrepreneurship, uh, which is actually a two in one. Yeah. And uh, given the time allocations, uh, the time given is much, much less than what we need. But all the same, we do what we can to ensure that uh, at least our students get some uh, functional, action-oriented uh, knowledge and skills that they will need to perform their roles uh, well after school. Okay, so Dr. Musisi, just like I prepare for the show before I started, mm. as a lecturer, normally there are times you get to organize yourself for the lecture. Mm. So what steps do you follow when organizing for a lecture? Um, first is to make a needs identification. You need to understand the needs of your learners. Uh, the learners here at the Therese Tutors College are not the traditional learners. These are adults yeah. who are, they are working as health workers and at the same time studying. So you cannot handle them the way we hand, handle our regular students back at Makere. Two, like I told you earlier, COVID has revolutionized everything. And we find that most of the things that we were teaching before do not work now. So you need to do a lot of homework, consult here and there, to bring the real situation outside into the classroom. So you need a lot of reading, uh, you need a lot of practice, and you need a lot of uh, preparing them assignments that reflect the world of work they are facing after here. So it really takes some serious preparation. All right, Doctor, uh, the rate of unemployment in Uganda is on the rise and so many students are grappling around with uh, lack of jobs. So after these students get done with their studies here, are they assured of job placements out there? No, I cannot say they are assured of job placements. 
But now what, we are, what I'm doing, I'll speak for myself, as an education economist and as an uh, entrepreneurship trainer, is to try as much as possible to give them an option. And what is the option? The option is of self-employment as a viable labor market option. I cannot tell you that all after graduation everybody is, to end up, is going to end up in a health training institution. But we also make sure that the skills we give them, given their background in medicine, can really help them to start up projects related to education or medicine that can enable them earn a better living and at the same time serving our nation. All right, so for students that are in an institution like this one, mm -hmm. a healthcare institution, mm -hmm. uh, what kind of projects would you advise them to go for? Uh, we advise them to appeal to their medical background and now their education background. They can marry the two and come up with the, some innovative ideas. I was talking to them, I'm telling them, Everybody is going in for a clinic, those who can. But has anybody thought about a mobile clinic? Instead of committing money to renting a, a building, why don't you buy a truck or a bus and uh, refurbish it into a mobile clinic? You get tents and stuff, and then you go look for people in their areas, rural areas, in these markets, in weekly markets. You pitch a camp somewhere, you have an examination tent, you have a treatment tent, something like that then the following week you go to another place you just have extended these medical services to the people cheaply and everybody is happy you are making money people who cannot make it to big hospitals are also having their health care needs satisfied and everybody is a winner so that is the kind of orientation we are making them look at things they didn't even consider uh, possible or things what you people call outside, thinking outside the box, that the opportunities out there are limitless. But it's your brain, brain uh, creativity, innovation that limits you. So that's what we focus on. And uh, we hope that at the end of the day, everybody will do self-evaluation and start doing beneficial things, but in a different way. All right, Doctor. So finally, I would like to ask you, what are some of the challenges you face as a lecturer in this institute? The challenges we face, one, are the numbers. Because if I'm to, teach, to, 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 to train them the way they should be trained, I'm, I'm meant to group them into five. We are I'm even meant to give them working capital so that we learn entrepreneurship on the job kind of very practical way. This is the way we are supposed to train them. And so that at the end of the day, each group comes up with a tangible project. But you know, the college cannot finance them. I mean, the numbers are impossible to group. So the best we can do is to focus on the action knowledge in the class, short of the practical knowledge that we would need to give them a full package. Uh, the ch another challenge as I face is that the workload, because now I'm trotting from here, I'm rushing back to Makerere, I have a lecture, and uh, here I also happen to be the one, the only education economist, so I don't have a helper, uh, I, I just have to be here, unlike other courses. Yeah, yes, short of staff. Yes, staff. Okay. And we well, will call my colleague that, no, under the class, I'm not able to come, I have to ensure that I come. All it is, they will miss the lecture, so that shortage. Another aspect is shortage of material, uh, like books and uh, uh, films and uh, whatever materials we would need to drive our points home. Those are not also adequate. Yeah, but we try our best, given the circumstances, to get the best out of them. Okay, so I'm going to ask you one question I'm so curious about. Mm -hmm. If you were given a chance, to step in front of the government or <laughs> president so far, <laughs> mm -hmm. what would be that thing that has been itching you a lot that you'd like to? What is itching me a lot is leadership. 
education leadership in the country. People right from pre-primary up to university become leaders by default, not by design. We do not have a, spe a specialized training institution for teachers. I'll give you an example. The lawyers, after four years of training at Makerere, they have a specialized training, Law Development Center, that focuses on legal practice. Here, people become education, leaders of education institutions because they are relatives to the school proprietors or because they have godfathers and godmothers in the right place or because they are experienced. They are professors, they are... But being a professor, being a senior lecturer doesn't necessarily mean you can be a good leader. So my appeal to the president would be to establish a specialized training institution for education leaders so that anybody aspiring to be a leader in education at least goes in there for six months, nine months, and secure that. Another thing I would ask is to emphasize, this is a program I'm writing, it's my own creation. Okay. It is called Enterprising Education Leadership, as opposed to the tradition, Enterprising Education Leadership, mm -hmm. as opposed to traditional education management. The problem we have in education is that most of the leaders are the traditional kind. The times have changed, needs have changed. So we need a leader who is enterprising, who is open to these innovative ideas, and who can make things to happen. But as long as still, people are still locked in the past with their traditional antics of managing educational institutions, it will be extremely difficult to have helpful innovations in education institutions without support from the top. All right. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Musisi. Thank there you. There was a lot of information, and we are glad to have had you on the show today. It was a pleasure. Okay, and blessings with everything thank you're you. doing. You're still watching the Education Forum here on UBC TV and we are still here at the Health Tutors College in Mulago and joining me right now on the show is Mr. Okoth Constantine who is of course the Academic Registrar for the Health Tutors College Mulago. Welcome sir. You're welcome madam. It's nice to have you on the show. Thank you. So Mr. Okoth, yes, madam. what is your role as the Academic Registrar? My major role is a student records. I keep their records right from the profile up to the academic records of this institution. Then uh, the second major role is to ensure quality teaching and learning in this institution. Yeah. All right, so just not anyone can come into this institution no. and say I'm going to bring my books, I'm going to study here. <laughs> yes. So <laughs> As a student that is joining this institution, yes, what requirements is, uh, what requirements are needed of these students as they are joining this institution? Yes, there are a number of requirements, but uh, the most important is maybe I will, I will connect it with the programs we are having. Mm -hmm. There are three programs in this institution. You have one higher diploma in clean construction. And for you to join higher diploma in clean construction, you need to be having an ordinary diploma in any health related subjects. Yeah. Then if you are to join postgraduate diploma in medical education, which is the second program, you must be having at least a second second lower class in a, with a Bachelor of Education in any of those uh, health related subjects and uh, another program is a Bachelor of Medical Education and to join it you must be having a diploma in uh, any of the health related uh, subjects. Yeah. And Mr. Koth, also speaking of uh, courses. Yes. I'm sure there are different courses that are being 
uh, studied here, yes. like in terms of nursing and so many others, yes. would you mind like mentioning some of them? Yes, the, we categorize them into three. We have uh, the nursing, we have the midwifery, and we have what we call allied, allied health. Now, allied health has about 23 different courses. We have the orthopedics, we have the, oh, so many, oh, all these programs which make up oh, health which are not nursing or, 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 or midwifery, we had to categorize them as a allied. So they are currently we have about 23 of them. Okay. Yeah. Which if I, as you are leaving, can give you our brochure, you, you will get them. There are so many there that are so you many cannot mention them. them. I may not mention <laughs> all, but we just know there are three. The, the specialists know. Mm -hmm. You are either nurse or midwife or allied health. <laughs> I am here at the library of the Health Tutors College Mulago where of course you can see there are so many publications including this one Campbell's Operative Orthopedics Volume 1 11th edition and of course we have so much more like Review of Medical Physiology, as you can see here. Well, this is the education forum here on UBC TV. Stay tuned. Okay, you're welcome to Ustas College Mulago Library. Uh, this is our library. Uh, as an institution, we are trying to run uh, a user-friendly library. And uh, what do we mean by user-friendly library? We mean uh, the, the, the services that we offer. Uh, first of all, we are operating... Uh, an automated library uh, whereby we have uh, the library management system that we use to, to manage our library stock and then uh, that also used to, 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 to do carry out our services. Then also have e-library platform whereby users can access e-books on uh, an e-repository. Uh, in this library uh, we have a uh, I wouldn't say our collection is a uh, is a uh, hundred percent perfect. Of course, even uh, for big libraries like Library of Congress, they still don't have enough. But of course, the library keeps on uh, upgrading and uh, adding on more and more. However, at least we are certain as a library when it comes to physical uh, stock, we we boost of eighty percent of our target in terms of uh, the hard books that we have in the library. So which can cover all the areas that we need, like uh, the, medic the medicine, health and, related, uh, uh, health, health and related subjects, then pedagogy for pedagogy, those are educational books. Then also have research in areas of research. We have the research proposals and dissertations uh, that, uh, that is done from the college. So at least for the stock, stock-wise, the library boosts of 70, 80%, at least 70% of the physical stock. However, also have issues uh, with uh, the 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 e resources. As a college, we don't subscribe to e resources, and we realize uh, the issue has been brought about by the, the 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 inadequate resources in the institution. The institution could not afford to subscribe annually for the e resources that require like around uh, one thousand two hundred US dollars. So it's a bit costly for the college given the number of our students in the college here. Uh, but uh, also uh, when it comes to utilization of the library services, our utilization I must say it's good because our users use the library, our student, tutor students use the library, our lecturers use the library and uh, how did we manage to, to attract library users in the library. As I told you in the beginning, our library we try to develop and operate a user-friendly library. When you look at our furniture, like the tables and the chairs, they are flexible. You can turn them in any way, for, in any way that you feel. If you want to engage in a group discussion, you can turn them. The, the tables are fine, they are flexible. The, chair, the chairs are flexible. And then when we're also operating uh, uh, an open shelf library. 
and when such this helps the users to get the books that they need on their own so they can go access the shelves pick the books that they need other than being limited by the librarian alone so that one alone uh, promotes the uh, utilization level of the, the library and then we also try to put in uh, as i told you also that we're having uh, Ill, uh, i mean automated library management system that's the opac that uh, i mean koha and with koha we're having uh, opac open public access catalog and this helps users whenever they come to the library to search and see what items exist in the library so that one also helps them to, to come and check what they need. So it's pro, it promotes the utilization level. Our stock is current. Because now if you are not subscribing to e-resources, then how are you going to tell people, how are you going to convince the world that you are having current stock? Because now if you look at the hard copies of the books, a book of 2010, you cannot tell us it's a current material. Because in that book, can you find any information on coronavirus? It's not there. So the issue, uh, we, in, when it comes when we talk of currency of our stock, we still have concerns, but we hope and we are hopeful the college is working upon it to see that they start subscribing to e-resources uh, through the consortium of Uganda University Libraries, that's cool. And once we do that, we hope our library shall be in a capacity to say we are having current stock. <music>still at the health tutors college here in Molago and it's becoming quite interesting familiarizing myself around the college and yes now I'm gonna engage the students and see what they study why they study and what their expectations are do not go anywhere this is the education forum here on UBC TV uh, I do bachelor's of medical education and uh, one biggest reason I chose to do this course uh, shifting from my former uh, profession, that is uh, dentistry, to medical education. Uh, number one, it is because of passion. Teaching is passion, and I chose to be a teacher or a tutor because I have the passion of educating the nation. And, uh, well, looking at other benefits added to this course, medical education, is that uh, compared to the health, which I practiced before, Medical education, I expect some holidays. Of course, when students go for holidays, as a tutor, you also have a holiday and you have to relax and be with your family. Uh, after this course, because I'm now in my third year and I'm soon finalizing in the next few months, and I expect to go back and teach uh, professionals who will change the health system of this country. Uh, I expect, of course, to have uh, an elevated cadre like one would be expecting, and may, maybe a better pay uh, as uh, a big uh, advantage. Of course, we are looking at financial uh, increment when we increase in CADA from diploma to bachelor's. We really expect all that much. I chose to do medical education because I naturally feel myself I'm a, pr I'm a proud teacher. I can do better in teaching, and I, feel, I felt that joy when uh, some of the students I interacted with previously before I joined, they told me, sister, you are our mentor. We really admire you, you've made us who we are. It really brought in that inspiration in me to pursue this course in medication, in medical education so that I can become a professional teacher. I have not felt any regret in doing this course because it's already yielding the social connections I'm getting from friends and also advancing in my teaching experience. It's really yielding. And I expect, as I finish this course, it's going to, I'm going to become a professional teacher, a competent one, who is able to, pro, to, to mentor my other young ones, students, the new generation, so that uh, they, can, they can become better persons, they can become better nurses and midwives out there in class, as well as in clinical practice, because that's, that is our major intention of teaching students. Well, isn't it just amazing? Well, I am as curious as you are to know what takes place in this place. So you can see there's a skeleton here. And as I told you before, it's getting more interesting. I'm familiarizing myself with this place. And when you look at my coach, you'll actually call me a doctor right now. <laughs>
Well, you can see there's a lot that is going on here. And of course, we are at the laboratory. We were at the library, we're in the classroom, we're in the principal's office, and we have met different lecturers. And now here we are in the laboratory where all the magic happens, okay? When you're speaking about magic, we're looking at babies here, we're looking at the skeleton, we're looking at so many different things. But well, we are going to get to know what happens here exactly from one of the medics. Stay tuned, this is the Education Forum here on you. BC TV. We have the skills laboratory of the nursing section, midwifery and allied health section. So we know that at the Health Tutors College, we train health workers who have been in the field with a lot of experience. So they come here to update their skills so that they can be useful in the education of the nurses and midwives of the country. So the, the practicals comes as the end result of the theories that we learn in the classrooms and the everyday activities that had been done in the wards. So here we have the time and the space to practice and to do what we have been what we have been learning. You are still watching the Education Forum with me, Amoge Victoria, here on UBC TV, and here with me is the Guild President of Mulago Health Tutors Training College. And yes, he's going to tell us more about his role as a Guild President. But first of all, uh, I would like him to first introduce himself. I'm Mulamba Nasul, uh, the Guild President of Health Tutors College, Mulago, and uh, yeah. You are welcome, I would say. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you very much. So, um, what, how does your role as a guild president of this institute differ from other universities and what are your duties as a guild president? Well, my role as the guild president in this maiden institution is quite similar to what the guild president in other institutions face. Only that the only biggest difference is that we deal with uh, mature people who are already full professionals so the way you handle them is slightly different from the way you handle the undergraduates and other people besides they are big people with huge minds and big ideas and they feel they need to earn their respect so my biggest role in this institution is to make sure that i bridge the gap between this whole student's body and the administration making sure that the two bodies, administrative body and the student's body, we are in tandem and we are moving well. Yeah. All right. So what is considered when electing a guild president of such an institute? Well, we have a constitution first and foremost that governs us to be elected as guild presidents. However, there are some stringent measures that must be uh, that must be achieved before you can stand or you can be eligible to stand as the guild president. Uh, one of them is that you must be on a normal academic progress. Normal academic progress means you don't have a retake and your CGPA should be 3.5 and above. That means you are actually academically sound to stand as a guild president. The other criteria followed is that you must have at least stayed in the institution for a full year. That is, you've completed either first year and then you are in second year, there you can stand to, to become the guild president. Then the other thing is that you must be neutral. You don't bring in issues, of course, right now in this institution, we don't have multi-party politics. We just rule that out and we are going well and so smoothly. So what we don't encourage is tribalism, multi-party politics, because we feel we are the same person. We don't need any differences amongst ourselves. Okay, yeah. so I just want, I want, just out of curiosity, mm. why of all the candidates that stood mm. for this position, mm. why were you chosen? Well, since it was matter of a secret ballot, I think they felt I had the qualities to be their best leader. Because I'm this kind of a simple guy, I'm very free, easily accessible, and I understand people's mind. And when we share all around together, both academically and socially, I think they felt I am the best candidate for the position. All right. Mm. Now, for all, how long have you been uh, the guild president so far? 
Uh, actually, I could say it is on record I am the longest serving Gildi president. Mm -hmm. uh, there was really a big gap between the student's body and the administration. Mm -hmm. So we tried to bridge that gap and at least bring a proper understanding between us, the students, and uh, the administration. Well, there were very big challenges that were arising academically. We also tried to bridge those gaps. And I, at least I made sure that academically we are progressing because previously we never had uh, we never had academic seminars in our college. I made sure during my regime we introduced those academic seminars and people are very busy enjoying and it actually it's helping us, promoting us and helping all the students body to learn and actually even pass their exams. Uh, being that we are even the pioneers of a new curriculum which was just brought, it has really helped a lot because the content is quite too deep uh, we go through a lot of things. The curriculum is a heavy one. So these academic seminars have actually tried to help our students. And okay. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. You have had a lot to say. Thank and you. Yes, keep the good work going. <laughs>